Welcome everybody to Professional Polished and Presentable. Sylvie and I are super excited to bring this to you. We had a lot of fun uh, putting this together and we hope that you have a lot of fun with us today. And, um, and about that, I just wanna say a couple quick words at the beginning um, about creating a safe environment that uh, where everyone can feel comfortable to have fun. Um, so we are gonna be following the code of conduct from USAR. Uh, it's on our webpage. Hopefully you have found our webpage already. Uh, that will be very helpful and totally necessary to, to find uh, during this workshop. Um, and you can find our code of conduct there. If anything happens during the during our tutorial that makes you uncomfortable that you would like to talk to someone about, please feel free to reach out privately to me or Sylvia or any of the people who have TA in their name. Um, they'll be helping us out and they're gonna introduce themselves in just a second. Another quick note, we're also recording this session. Uh, the video will be available later. Feel free to keep your cameras and microphone off during the main section, but we will be using breakout sessions and going out into those um, to do some activities. In those sessions, they will not be recorded and you can feel comfortable turning your video and, camera and microphone on if you prefer and hopefully uh, interact with the other people in your groups. So with that, let's get started. Uh, first of all, my name is Garrick and, um, and I work for our studio and I do a lot of tinkering with sharing and things and I'm very happy to be here today. And we're going to have our teaching assistants introduce themselves as well. We'll start with Shannon, please. Hi, I'm Shannon Pelleggi. I'm very excited to be learning along with you all today. And uh, please reach out if you have questions that I can help you with. Hi, I'm Patricia. I, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, like uh, Shannon said, uh, any things, uh, any question that you have, uh, I'm here uh, to help you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay, and I'm Sylvia, and I'm the other instructor for this tutorial today. Also very excited to be here. Um, I also enjoy using Sharingan a lot, and um, and I'm a researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where I use R every day for data analysis. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. But first, we're going to do a little tour of the website so everybody can see where everything is. So this is the people page, and we have different tabs along the top uh, toolbar. And if you go to materials, this is where you're going to find um, an overview of the tutorial. There's three different sections or three different acts. And you would have received a link to the pre-work before today with some um, tasks to complete before the tutorial. And then there are three additional uh, sections. So Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3, and um, all covering different aspects of using sharing and to make great presentations. And if you get lost at any point, um, you can always come back to this materials page and find a schedule on the left-hand side of this in the sidebar with links to each of the different sections. And so I'm going to use that to navigate to the first section or scene one, which is setting the stage and we'll get started. This is what a page looks like. We have a title at the top. We have uh, two link buttons, for, one for slides and the other for activity. The slides are also found embedded on the page that you can use, um, you can view in full screen using the full screen button on the bottom right of that window. There's a sidebar again on the left that has the different sections also located in there that you can use to navigate the site. And the activity, which I mentioned is linked at the top, you can also find down uh, below the embedded slides. So there's a little topic section about what we're gonna cover and then the activity starts under that. Now this section has about how long the, the activity is gonna take the materials that you'll want to navigate to in your materials uh, repository that you should have downloaded before the tutorial. And then it'll also indicate the activity mode. Um, so for this first section, for example, we're going to use breakout rooms and everybody in their own breakout room will be able to say hello to one another and then um, work together as a group to complete the activity, which is also included written in this section. And, and also will likely be reflected in the slides for each of the different sections that we go through today. Okay, so setting the stage. 
we're going to do a little bit of review of Sharingan. So welcome everyone. We're going to learn how to make great slides with Sharingan today, Sharingan and friends. And so we're going to review a few things. So what is Sharingan? Sharingan is a package that introduces Remark JS, JS stands for JavaScript, to the R Markdown package. And you can see the documentation is linked on the right hand side of this slide. And then Remark.js is, as the slide indicates here, a simple in-browser markdown-driven slideshow tool that's targeted at people who know their way around HTML and CSS. And if that doesn't sound like you right at this moment, don't worry, because by the end of the tutorial, you will know your way around HTML and CSS. So what is CSS? Just to give a really, really quick overview, or an example, rather. CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheet, and it turns uh, functional but rather dull HTML content, which is shown on the left-hand side of, um, of the slide, which shows the text, uh, but without any styling applied to it. And then on the right-hand side, we see that the CSS styling helps transform it into HTML content with style. So it looks very, very different. On the right-hand side, there's a, the same slide, but with styling applied. And there's different fonts that you can notice. There is a background image, um, different sizes, and some additional um, aesthetic features. So let's get started. We're going to, uh, the first thing you want to do is when you navigate to the, the, uh, the first section, which is the introduction, and it should be labeled 01-introduction in your materials repository. That folder ha has a file within it, an R Markdown file that's called 01-start. So you can go ahead and open that R Markdown file, which will probably look pretty familiar since everyone here is probably at least a little familiar with Sharingan. And then the next step will be to run this specific function from the Sharingan package called Infinite Moon Reader. So if you run this function, you'll be able to render your slides write in the RStudio IDE, if that's what you use, um, to preview the slides today. And so we'll be doing this, we'll be following these steps um, a few different times throughout the tutorial today. So if you're able, if you're able to render the slides and you ran Infinite Moon Reader, you will see, um, and actually let's just go ahead and do that together. So on this screen, what I'm showing is my IDE, which is RStudio. On the left-hand side, I have the 01-start R Markdown file open. And then on the right-hand side, I have my console in the upper right, and I have the files visible on the bottom right. And if anybody has um, or would like to see this a little bit larger, the text anywhere, whether on the website or in the, in the IDE environment, please let us know and I can magnify it. Um, so in this 01-introduction folder of the materials repository, I have this R Markdown file that I opened. And so what I'm gonna do is run that function in the console that I mentioned earlier. So that is the Sharingan Infinite Moon Reader, and these two are the same. So I'm just gonna run Infinite Moon Reader, and then we'll see what happens. There's some messaging that shows up in the console. Okay, and then generally you'll see a line in the output that says output created, and then you'll see it's rendered an HTML version of the slides. And so those slides are visible in the bottom right now in the viewer pane. And so this is what we'll be looking at for the activity um, that we'll be doing in a little bit. Um, but for starters, let's just go back to the slides, uh, my slides, and we can look at what, what components um, start this document. We'll review a little bit of that. So the first section of the R Markdown file is the YAML, and so it includes lots of different parameters, including a title, um, in this case, a subtitle, the author, an institute, the date, and so on. And so th there's also very uh, specific parameters relating to the output, which is the Sharingan um, slide deck. And so we can see here in this YAML, move my options around the screen a little bit, that there's a slide number format 
specified. There's also a specific syntax um, highlighting option for code. We also see um, that code line highlighting is enabled with true. There's also a ratio that you can specify. It's set to 16 to nine. You can also change that to other, um, other sizes. Four to three is another popular one. And then the last section here of the YAML is incremental slide counting is set to true. The next piece of the R Markdown file is the setup chunk. And so here, what I wanna draw your attention to is there are some options that are set at the top of your document that will apply um, to the rest of the document and the different code chunks. And so you can um, see that there's a few different ones enabled there, like suppressing warning, warnings and messages. And then there's also a couple of lines that load two libraries. One is Font Awesome, which is an icon package, and the other is Tidyverse, which is a collection of data science packages. Okay, so with that, let's move on to the activity. There's a link in the slide that'll take you to the activity, and which will be a, a sharing and scavenger hunt. You can also escape um, full-size slides if you have that. Um, if that's how you access the slides to come back to the main page. And so if we go down to the activity section, you'll find different steps. So at this point, I'll ask that um, Garrick have people use or separate into the breakout rooms. And then you can start with this section here labeled sharing and scavenger hunt. So the idea is that you'll explore the HTML slide deck that we rendered in the IDE and then see if you can identify these different classes and features that are built into Sharingan. So try to look at the HTML slides first and explore those and see if you can pick out visually what some of those classes and features might be. And then check the R Markdown file to see if you are correct, if you did find the different things that are included in the slide deck. All right, we're about to go into breakout rooms. Um, I'll give a one minute warning when we're about to come back into the main room. All right, have fun everyone. Okay, welcome back everybody. I think everyone has been time warped back into the main room by now. Um, hopefully you had fun during that session. Um, and just a reminder that sometime that uh, if you don't have enough time for all of, to complete the whole activity that uh, all of the instructions are still gonna be on our website and you can follow up. Uh, with them there. So next up, we're going to talk about our style guide. So I'm going to, I just shared the link and I'll open the slides. We're going to talk about making a style guide with, uh, with a package called sharing and themer. Um, so first of all, do you have your style guide on hand? If you don't, you're going to want to get it real quick, pull that out. Um, usually you can find these online depending on your uh, organization or depending on um, or maybe you have to talk to the marketing department, but you can generally do something like Google for your company, uh, branding guide, style guide, design guide, something like that. And you hit search and you'll get back a, uh, a branding guide, usually a, a booklet or a, a web page that kind of goes through a number of different things that are kind of critical for the brand, like colors, uh, typography, fonts, uh, some ideas around logos and design, and some examples of promotional materials. So we're going to use all of these together to create a full Sharingan theme. Um, if you don't have a style guide for your organization, we've picked out a couple. These were also listed on uh, the pre-work page. Um, one of them that I really like is the gov.uk design system. Uh, the US web design system is also a treasure trove of information, and the Urban Institute Data Visualization Style Guide has a lot of information about designing for uh, data visualization, which is probably of interest to a lot of people here. So the package we're going to talk about today that helps you go from style guide to sharing and theme is appropriately named sharing and themer. Um, the, the basic idea with this package is you start with your, your basic sharing and theme that uh, looks um, wonderful, but we'd like it to look a little, a little better and a little bit more uh, kind of matching our style guides, right? So adding in sharing and themer, there's you're basically one function call away from a complete sharing and theme with just a few choices that you have to make about colors and typography. 
So how do you get started with Sharing Themer? Once you've installed it, you can use the Create New R Markdown Document um, dialog in R Studio, and you can select from template and then pick Ninja themed presentation instead of the regular Ninja presentation. Um, inside of that document, which will get you started and kind of has like a whole lot of different components that can um, to kind of demo your theme, uh, there's an R chunk. It has the title Sharing in Themer, and we've set it to like include equals false so that the output doesn't show up. But what this does is it basically writes out a complete theme. And um, here's, here's one of the functions. So you do need to make some choices, right? So we need to pick some functions. And um, there's a whole, there are two families basically of style functions. Um, the first one is uh, a monotone. These four functions kind of, um, hinge around one color. So if there's one dominant color for your for your color palette, you would use style mono. And then depending on how you want the defaults to be set up, you can use style mono light, dark, accent, or accent inverse. So accent is basically a light color um, or white background with the color, the single color as an accent color. And um, accent inverse is sort of the inverse of that. So a dark slide background with the one color that you're picking as an accent color. The other option is to use uh, the style duo functions. These are prefixed with style underscore duo. Um, this means there are two colors. You pick a primary color and a secondary color, and then how they're combined together is the last bit. So either they kind of dominate the slides, that's style duo, they're used as accent colors, that's style duo accent, or the inverse, and um, uh, that would be accent inverse. Um, it's easy to play, it's easy to switch these around once you start playing with them. So. And for most cases, this function style duo accent is going to be a good choice. Uh, it's a good place to start. Um, and, and that's it. We're just going to jump right into trying to use this. If you go to this link, which I'm going to share in the chat window right now, um, I'm going to send everybody back into the, into the groups and um, we'll walk through using your style guide to create a starting theme with uh, just a couple steps. So in just one second, we'll go back to the breakout room. We're going to spend uh, about eight minutes on this. So I'll see you everyone back here in eight minutes. Have fun. Okay, welcome back again. I hope that was fun. And um, just a little reminder, if you're having any trouble, your best bet is to talk to the other people in your breakout group or to directly message one of the TAs. Um, it's a little bit hard for me out in the main group to be able to address questions, but uh, the TAs can jump around and uh, we can work together to answer your questions, um, which probably the first place to start would be in the breakout group too. So I hope that went well and um, you have, you're on your way to having a full, uh, a full style, a full sharing in theme style for your slides. Um, next up, we're going to talk about sharing in extras. So this is probably like the most fun part for me um, is to talk about uh, these extra little things that we can do for our slides. So um, I'm gonna talk first about some of the features inside of Sharingan that are helpful, some things we can do with R Markdown, and then a cool little package that you can uh, use to add little bits and pieces of extra things into your slides. So first I'd like to talk about presenter notes. Um, if you haven't used these before, this is a, a typical slide. Maybe you're talking about popular cultural references to lemurs and you bring up Madagascar the movie and um, you want to have some notes for yourself. So you can add notes to your slides using these three question marks. So sort of like you create a new slide with three back ticks, you create a section of, of presenter notes with three question marks and then you have a, uh, a section uh, where you can just some, type some notes to yourself. Um, once you get to the actual slide, you can push P and then just push P and you get to presenter mode. So you can have your slides uh, next to each other. So you can remember to say that uh, basically the only pop popular cultural references to lemurs is the Disney movie Madagascar. Um, okay, but what if, uh, so presenter mode tips are, are great. They don't necessarily need to be just for you. Uh, they could be for other people who discover your slides afterwards. You can use them as a way to, uh, to as you're working through your slides, write presenter notes to yourself and, um, and then fill in your slide content. That's another great way to do it. Um, if they are for you though, I would like to show you a little tip about how you can present while looking at your presenter slides. So this all rests on using a private browser window. 
So, the, so there's like three things in there. First of all, you can use this little icon in our studio. You click that on the preview and open your slides in an actual browser and not inside of our studio. The other thing to remember is that actually, you, we really don't want to use Moon Reader because Moon Reader does the neat thing where it flips back and forth between slides, but sometimes it fights with you. So I actually recommend instead that you put your slides online and then present from there, which is what we're doing here. So try not to use Moon Reader. And I'll show you how to use a private browser window in just a second. You can clone the slides into a new window by pressing C, then you pick the full browser or the clone window to share, and then you press P in the window that you're not sharing. So let's see how this looks. So here I have um, our slides, and I click the Slides button. And actually, I right click, and I click Open Link in New Private Window. And now you can see you don't actually see all of my little browser icons and extensions and stuff. I push C. Sometimes you have to actually like say, yes, please do open this pop-up. And you can kind of resize these. I'll sometimes put these on different windows. And you pick one or the other to share in Zoom, for example push P to enter presenter mode on the other one, and now they are synced up. So you could imagine your audience is seeing the full slides while you're looking just at the presenter notes in front of you. Um, great. All right, our next little tip, code and plots. This is like the greatest hard thing about Sharingan. The awesomest part about Sharingan is that you can put your code inside of your slides. And you can have the output right there. On the other hand, the less awesome part is sometimes the code. Like you really want the code to be readable. You want people to be able to look at it. Uh, and you also would like people to be able to see the plot that you made. Uh, this is a really great example where the plot is out of frame and uh, this is not, not great. So how can we show the code in the plot separately? Here are two little things that you can use to do this. So the first is you take your, your R chunk and you add eval equals false. And then later in another slide, you might reference that chunk using this ref.label chunk option and say, we're going to use, this says basically use the code from the lemur weight chunk. And this time I might just turn off the echo and get just the output. So what's really great about this option is it works for anything, not just plots. So any kind of R code output that you want, the R code first and the plot later, um, you can use this trick. Here's another trick. If what you're trying to do is actually separate plots and that the code, you can um, think about it like this. So in a regular R chunk, we run the code and then NITR or R markdown basically will add in this little bit and say, we're gonna reference, um, make an image at uh, using this thing, this file is generated from this R code. So we can do this manually. We don't need to rely on Knitter to do this for us. So we can do this by saying fig.show equals hide. This hides any figure output from this chunk. And then we can use this function, Knitter, this function from Knitter, right, called fig chunk. Um, and here you have to say which chunk and then the type of image that you want. In, this, in my case, I want PNG. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. You could put this on a new slide. You could, for example, make it the background image in another slide and have a full screen plot so that everybody can see your plot uh, well. Um, you can do a lot of really neat things with this. Here's one more kind of cool thing. You could put them on the same slide, but in different slides. So here I have the code and I have a little panel that I can flip between the code and the output. And now you're saying, how do you do this? So this is a, we can do this with a package called Sharingan Extra. There are a lot of really exciting things in here for Sharingan slides. There's a lot that Sharingan Extra can do. Here's a full list-ish. I'm sure I, there's some things that I left out on this list and it's way too long. So you can come back and explore that later, but let's talk about just a few things. So first of all, you just saw how to make uh, panels with a, a feature called Panel Set, and we'll talk about that again. We can, um, you can add in a feature called tile view, which lets you view an overview of your presentation. So if I push O, I've, I've added this to my slides. If I push O, I now have a full overview of my presentation and I can kind of just jump around. It makes it easy to go back to a previous slide and it also makes it easy to get back to where we were. You can make your slides editable where you can actually like mark sections as things like I want to type here and I can, thanks to editable. So you can edit your slides as you're talking. This is great for taking notes, 
audience participation, Wi-Fi passwords that you uh, don't know before you start the workshop, that kind of thing. And then finally, um, Scribble. I like Scribble. It, it lets you write on your presentation. So you may have noticed this little pencil icon up here. If I click this, I'm now in Scribble mode and I can actually draw on my slides and move around. So when you change slides, the Scribble stays with the slide. Um, you can push the S button to jump into Scribble mode. You can pick your own colors and say, this is, you know, this is now purple. This is pretty cool. And, um, and also you could clear the Scribble away and start all over. Oh, and there's one more. Once you've made your awesome slides, uh, you can share them online using the share again um, extra. So you see this in action in our website where you have that little share bar along the bottom that helps you navigate through uh, the slides. And uh, this is a great way to make sure that people find your slides and, and look through them when you find them online. So how do you get sharing an extra? You're going to use remotes to install it and um, generally call a function, use sharing an extra. And here you can just list the extras that you want to add. Or sometimes you can add them individually by using individual functions like use underscore scribble. Fantastic. So a real quick introduction to panel sets. For, for a panel set, you have to call use uh, you have to add it to your slides. So here I added it with you sharing an extra. And then you open a panel set kind of set area. You add a panel to that. And you can put some content in the panel. It's helpful to give the panel a name, which you can do with a dot panel dash name. And um, at this point now, you can have multiple panels all inside one panel set. And you get something that looks like this. There's one last option, which is this very common situation where you have an R chunk that you'd like to put in a panel set. And you can do this by wrapping it in panel set and then just adding panel set equals true to the chunk. And you get, and this is how you get code that looks like this. So we are going to jump into our activity. You get to kind of play around with the things that I just showed you and walk through them. Um, I'll keep the breakout room open until the top of the hour. If at some point, though, you'd like to get up and go take a break, um, please feel free to do so. And we will start back here again um, at the top of the hour. So I'll see you all soon. Have fun. OK, we're going to go ahead and get started with the next section. Um, can someone confirm that they can see my slides that I'm sharing? Yes, I can. Okay, great, thank you. So this next section, section four, or scene four, is about effective communication. And this section won't have active um, working in your RStudio IDE, so you don't need to worry about looking over there or working in there. Um, but it will be interactive in the sense that I'll try to ask questions um, and encourage people to think about certain things as we go through some specific slides. So effective communication is um, great because it captures the attention of your audience. It can help convince others of your findings. It can help you teach more effectively if that's something that you do. And generally speaking, it helps you reach a broader audience. So how can, um, or how does Sharingan already help us build effective presentations? So for this section and the next one, we're gonna be looking at or using some guidelines, some guidelines for accessibility that were developed by the authors of Making Scientific Content More Accessible, which is linked on the slide at the bottom, um, to explore how these things are intertwined with just effective communication in general and reaching a broader audience. So back to the question of the slides, how does Shangan already help us do this? So the first two items on this list, the first one says, Use the right markup for your presentation structure. So luckily for us, sharing in, um, because it lets us create slides using our markdown, it already helps us do that sort of thing because we are already familiar with using um, headings and structuring content for markdown. And that in and of itself helps create more accessible output because these things end up being hard coded into the HTML code that goes into creating your slides, um, or other kinds of websites if you're using R Markdown in different ways. 
The second item on this list is um, the recommendation is to stick to widely used and open file formats. So again, because Sharingan helps us make HTML slides that we can share openly, we can post them on GitHub, we can post them using Netlify. Um, we, it already helps us do this, so widely sharing our content um, openly. So let's dive into these other four items on the list with a little more detail. So this slide is that when we think about creating um, effective slides, that it goes really well and it goes hand in hand with making slides accessible. So there's a figure on the right hand side of this slide from the Inclusive Design 101 Toolkit by Microsoft. And so it's meant to represent this idea that when you're designing for one more constrained situation or, or um, a particular user and that you could extend that design and that solution to the broader population. So it's really not ever being made only for one specific group or for one specific individual because when we center accessibility in our design process, we end up extending um, great features and solutions to everybody. So the figure um, represents, there's a, there's a persona that has one arm and so it starts, the process would start here with maybe designing a solution for somebody with one arm and that would be considered a, a permanent um, disability, for example. But the same kinds of solutions that help that person also help somebody that has a temporary disability, for example, an arm injury. And, and then following that down the line even further, that also helps people that might be limited um, by their situation. So maybe somebody is a new parent and they're holding their child and so they only have um, the ability to use one of their arms, for example. So that kind of shows one example of what the process could look like when we're designed for a specific group, but then extend these solutions to the broader population. So three of the principles that are highlighted um, by this inclusive design 101. The first one is that you recognize exclusion. And so that really speaks to tapping into um, empathy for other people and the experiences that they have and using that to, to help power the solutions that we design, keeping those people in mind the entire time. The second one is the one I've alluded to quite a bit, which is to solve for one, but extend to many. And the third one listed here is to learn from diversity. So when we design um, documents or presentations or, or solutions in any other way, it's important to center the people that you are building a solution for. And so it's important to, um, to ask these communities about or for their input, for their experience, because they are the experts um, with their experiences. And those are the experiences that you'd like to help um, support in the design of your tool or your slides, for example. So design for the mode of delivery is another one of the guidelines. So one of the things that I wanted to really highlight here is that when we're making slide decks, we don't need to feel constrained by the idea of having everything that we are working on that could maybe live in a publication of some kind, we don't need to feel constrained to fitting that all into a slide deck. Um, and so that really just speaks to how there's different design considerations for slides than for papers or posters. And so we're gonna learn a little bit more about how to leverage that today. So one of the um, recommendations that I would have would be to design content with fewer and more focused details. So only focusing on content that is helping carry your message forward. There are, on the right hand side, there are some design tips that are adapted from a book by Jonathan Schwabish called Better Presentations. I, I really recommend it. It's got a um, great resources and a nice framework to think about. So the design tips are uh, use content, context relevant visual aids to help communicate your message. Focus attention and include only the most relevant details. So again, only that information that helps carry your message. And then unify your content by maintaining some consistency in how you lay out the content and structure it. So let's dive in a little deeper as to what that means in practice. So what does it mean in practice when we're using visual aids and sharing in? 
So on this slide, I have four different tabs using panel sets, which we got a peek at in the last section. And the first one says, not good. So I would say that this slide example is, uh, is not good. And so let's travel to that specific slide so we can get a closer look at it. And in doing that, I'm gonna demo um, a feature of Sharingan that's built in that can be really handy. So there's a link here that says example slide colon not good. So I'm gonna click that link and that takes me directly to that slide that I had a screenshot of prior. And so there's some content here and generally speaking visually, this is not a very visually appealing slide. Um, so let's travel back to the original slide which I've included a link to on the bottom here. And so the reason I'm showing how this can be done is because sometimes you might want to have a diagram or a graphic of some kind, some kind of um, visual representation of data on one slide. But you, you often will want to provide a different way of examining the same data, maybe as an HTML table. And so it might be too much to fit on one slide, but you can split it up into different slides and then link between them um, right within Sharingan. And so if I hit the letter P to look at my presenter notes, on the right-hand side, you'll see presenter notes for this slide. And so we'll see here, um, there's a heading here that, that's where the notes for the slide are. And then the notes for the next slide are a little bit further down. But here we see that we can use Markdown within our presentation notes. And what I wanna draw your attention to here is that the slide with the heading visual not good, I've given it a name right underneath where I began the slide. So right after the three dashes, I give it a name of visual not good. And then below that is where I would place my slide content. And so I can use that name to then link to that slide anywhere else in the slide deck. And the way I would do that is by using um, the hashtag and then the name of the slide that I'd like to link to. So that's how I am using um, these features in the current slide deck. So let's travel back to the first, or to the last slide that we were looking at. I'm having a hard time clicking this. Oh, well, for some reason it's not, I'm not able to click this. Okay, so instead I'm gonna use I'm gonna hit O and use overview and travel back to that slide instead. Okay, so what would a better version of this be? So we started with not good and the next one is good. So there's some changes here that make it look a little bit better. Oops, so let's go back to not good and flip to good. So we can see that there's um, something more appealing about the way that the visual good slide um, looks. And then if we take it a step even further, there's a better version of this. And so I'm gonna flip back and forth a few times. I want you to see if you can notice what looks different and what you like more potentially. So this is good and this is better sometimes. Um, and so what I would say to summarize this is that you want to avoid writing a wall of text, which was what the not good slide was doing. And you wanna break up the content and then you, um, I would recommend also adding a visual aid if it's gonna help carry the message. If it's gonna detract from the message, then maybe it's not um, as great of a tool to have at your disposal. And the other tip is to turn your visual into a larger background image. So we don't need to, in this case, we don't need to limit ourselves to wherever the image can fit on the right-hand side of that slide, but if we make it a background image, we make a little bit better use of that space. And so I say it's better sometimes because not all images are gonna look great as a background. And some of, sometimes it might interfere with the text that's on the slide and that ends up detracting from your message. So, um, so that's something to consider when you're designing your slides. And so I have an, uh, a note here that if your text overlaps with the background image, and you really would like to use it, then maybe consider using some CSS styling to give your text a background for contrast. And so we'll go through that a little bit later. Okay, this next one is about focusing attention. So this is an okay slide, 
And this is where we left off in the last slide. So the last slide we were um, talking about visuals and using visual aids. And so for this one, we're gonna be talking specifically about how to focus attention. And so we're starting with the slide that has some text on the left-hand side that's broken up into different paragraphs. And we have a large background image on the right-hand side. So it looks okay. But the next one, whoops, the next one looks a little bit better. So I'm gonna flip back, this one looks okay. And this one looks a little bit better. Part of why it looks better is because it's broken up a little bit more, there's bullet points. And so there's less text on the slide and it's organized a little bit differently. And then it can look even better in some cases if you emphasize the strong points with color or with bold. And so if I flip back to good and then better, we can see some of those differences. That's also a matter of personal preference. Okay, an alternative is, although well, we have to travel here to see it. Okay, the alternative is to incrementally reveal parts of your slide. And so you would be showing bullet points whenever you wanted the audience to see them. And that can be really helpful as an alternative. And then there's a version of this with that's a little bit better if you wanted to emphasize certain parts of your text. Okay, and so I say that this is better sometimes because you can't always use incremental reveals in sharing and there's certain situations where you can use it, but not always. Um, you can't easily combine incremental reveals with different classes, for example. Um, and then the other piece, and let's go back to the focus. Oh, I can't do it. Okay, let me travel back to our focusing attention slide. And so let's take a look at the summary points. Okay, so I would recommend structuring your text into smaller pieces and eliminating extra text. So again, the text that isn't helping you carry your message. Emphasize important words or phrases with text formatting and um, use incremental reveals to control the timing of your content. But it's important, I wrote a, a note here, to provide a version of your slides without incremental reveals for people that use screen readers. Because in sharing in when this, uh, when one uses incremental reveals, it ends up looking like multiple, or reading, I should say, like multiple different slides with each incremental reveal. And that can be pretty cumbersome to navigate using a screen reader. The next piece of um, designing for your mode of communication is to unify your content. So when we look at, when we think about layout, I would recommend being consistent in your use of content, content classes, uh, placing text and images kind of consistently between slides, maybe not having um, images on the left-hand side and then on the right-hand side and then flipping back to the left-hand side. So maintaining some consistency there and balancing the content so that the slide is not too full is gonna be helpful also. And on the right-hand side, there's some tips for structure. So leverage some of these markdown features like headings and lists to help provide hierarchy and organization to your content. Use color, font size, and font type consistently. This is also not a place where you wanna be um, mixing a whole bunch of things together in one slide deck. And then the last tip there is to use a similar style or theme of images or photographs. So if you like using illustrations, um, then you maybe also want to use photographs, uh, maybe be a little bit thoughtful about when you use each of them so you're not necessarily flipping back and forth between different styles. Okay, this guideline is use clear and simple figures and graphics. So when images and figures are really complicated, they can be really difficult for your audience to process while you're presenting. And there, which also makes it difficult um, for you to describe your image out loud as you're presenting. If it's really complicated, that becomes more difficult. And then it also makes it difficult then to describe your image with alternative text, which we'll talk about a little later as well. And this is the text description of an image that a screen reader would use um, in reading. And then write clearly is um, another big recommendation for accessibility. So engage a broad audience with clear language. So this might mean providing descriptive slide headings. So instead of a heading saying results or 
methods. Maybe give the audience the answer by providing a descriptive heading that tells the audience what you'd like them to know about your slide. Um, also introduce and define abbreviations, define field specific terminology, and then also consider writing to an audience outside of um, your discipline and even outside of academia altogether. So in practice, what this looks like is trying to write for an audience um, between the ages of 12 and 15 years old, or maybe at an eighth grade reading level if you're targeting a really broad audience, or a 12th grade uh, comprehension level if you're targeting a, uh, an educated or specialized audience. And so, and of course that's um, context dependent. So uh, if we have time, which I'm not sure if we do, I was gonna check the readability of the lemur content that we were looking at in our example slides, but this process is also laid out in the activity. So I think maybe I would rather skip that demo and, um, and ask you to check the activity for some screenshots of what that process looked like. Okay, let's move on to the next section, which is tightly intertwined with this one, which is about accessible design. Let's go, okay. So with this section, we're gonna be looking at the, the next set of guidelines for accessibility from that same publication that I mentioned earlier. So let's start off with um, a reminder that uh, this section does include an activity. And so for this, you can just follow along with me on the slides or you can follow along with um, the material in your materials repository folder. So again, you'd wanna restart your R session so that it's a little bit easier to run sharing an infinite moon reader to preview your slides. So we'll start here with a quote from Tim Berners-Lee, who is the um, World Wide Web Consortium Director and inventor of the World Wide Web. Um, and he says, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. So this is really important to keep in mind when we're developing content um, using our markdown that, uh, that ends up producing HTML that we can show on the web somewhere. Um, this, this is such an easy thing to do with our markdown that it really takes a little bit of extra um, intention to make sure that the content that we are sharing in this way is accessible to more people. So how do we do this? Um, I put down the first guideline from our last section here again, because it's so important, and that's to make accessible your default mindset and centering accessibility. Um, other ones include supporting images with text, making sure your hyperlinks are clear and unambiguous, and choosing colors carefully. So let's dive in. So this is the same slide as before. So again, just make sure that you're centering accessibility when you're designing documents um, right from the get-go so that you don't have to come back and edit them later, but also so that you keep that frame of mind that you're, you're wanting to share your work with as broad of an audience as possible. We can support images with text by adding alternative text or alt text. And this is a textual description of an image that helps the reader understand an image without seeing it. And screen readers or screen reader technology provides a voice, provides voice or braille access to computer text, including alt text. Some of the alt text options for our markdown are listed on the right, which includes um, markdown, our markdown code chunks, and then raw HTML also. So in practice, if we wanted to add alt text with markdown, we would use the syntax that we're familiar with, which is the exclamation point square brackets, and then parentheses. And the alt text would get inserted between the square brackets. And so here I have an example of an image on the right-hand side of three different lemurs. And I'm trying to describe um, the lemurs in this, in this case. And so my alt text reads, ring-tailed lemurs with alternating black and white rings along the entire length of their tail. And then I also have the file image in the parentheses. 
if we wanted to do this with our markdown and our markdown code chunks, we can actually add alt text to an R markdown code chunk output with a new code chunk option that is fig.alt. Um, and this was released uh, earlier this year. So it's a very exciting addition. Um, and then the way that this would look would be, for example, here I have a code chunk that I've opened with three back ticks and a curly brace. And I have R being specified as a language in that code chunk. And then I follow that with the fig.alt um, code chunk option. And then I insert my alt text between the quotes. And so here is my alt text again, which is about the ring-tailed lemurs and I'm describing them. And then underneath that, I would have the, the content of the code chunk. So in this case, I'm adding an image using the knitter include graphics function. And that's it. And so then that alt text gets attached to, um, to the output of that include graphics function. And this is really, really handy for any kind of, um, anytime you're producing an image output, but it, this works with ggplot as well. So whenever you make a, a data visualization, you can insert, and you should insert alt text for that as well. So if you're following along in your, um, in your materials, this uh, section talks about adding a text description to the lemur image slide on the slide that's titled ring-tailed lemurs. And so in our 05-start.rmd file, there's a section where there's an R markdown code chunk and the fake alt code chunk option is there, but it's empty. And so the activity is to add alt text to there and just practice um, doing that. So something that, um, that I was asking myself when I first started learning how to write alt text and that I've seen other people ask is, um, you know, is it a good idea to use the same alt text for all of the images that are identical? I mean, if you have one image and you're using it different places, is it, you know, appropriate to copy and paste the alt text into these different, um, these different examples given that it's the exact same image? And so the answer is not necessarily because writing effective alt text means that we also need to consider the context in which that image is being used. Sometimes an image is just meant to be decorative, but other times it's helping you carry a message and, uh, and that message needs to be reflected in the alt text. So, so consider that, you know, what if any important information is the image supposed to help you communicate? And I've listed um, three different resources on this slide that I found really helpful and, and I use uh, very often to remind myself of how, what kind of mental checks to make when I'm trying to describe an image, given the particular context that I'm in. Okay, uh, another guideline for accessibility is to make sure hyperlinks are clear and unambiguous. So um, our markdown and sharing can help us um, communicate using hyperlinks because you can insert hyperlinks right in your sharing in slides, which is great. And we've already seen a lot of examples using that. Um, but these links are most useful when they make sense out of context um, and they should be clearly labeled. So this means avoiding links like here, click here, more, read more, because on their own, they're not really telling us anything. It's better to, um, to give them descriptive titles. And that's what the next activity is for, whether you do it right now or whether you decide to do it later. Um, the activity is to edit the link text to be more descriptive. So there's a spot in the 05-start R markdown file. Um, there's a slide called ring-tailed lemurs. And so the activity is to replace the link titled here with link text that makes sense out of context. And so the chunk that I'm referring to is on the bottom half of this slide. And currently it reads, the Duke Lemur Center provides more information here. And so again, here is, is very um, ambiguous. We don't really know what it's referring to. Um, and importantly, sometimes when people are using screen readers, there's, um, there's a way that they can that it can access all of the links on a page at the same time so that they can browse different links um, without having to peruse the entire page, for example. And so it really, really helps to have descriptive titles for that reason, rather than having a bunch of links that all say something that, um, that doesn't make sense out of context. 
And then the last one here, the last recommendation, which is a really important one, is to choose colors carefully. Um, you want to avoid using color as the only way to indicate priority or importance or interactivity of something on your slide. And so we'll want to check for color independence early and often. And the way we can do that is by simulating a grayscale display, which I'll demo shortly. And then you also want to check the colors in your palette for adequate color contrast. And so let's go ahead. I can demo this um, color independence check that I do sometimes. So I'm opening my slides in a different tab. I'll travel back to the slide we were looking at. And so in Firefox, I can right click and inspect the page. So that means pulling up some of the fun behind the scenes stuff happening. And there's an option here for accessibility. So I'm selecting that in the main toolbar. And so within that section, there's another tab that says simulate. And so if I click on that, I can simulate a chromatopsia or no color. And that puts your content in grayscale. And this can be a nice way for one to check if there's anything that you're wanting to stand out, but, but you, can't, you can't distinguish it because the colors are too similar. Um, and so it might end up looking all the same. And this is a really, really nice check to make if you're um, creating data visualizations because you can make sure that the, the things that you want to be distinguished from one another um, are not relying on color only to do that. Okay, and then the activity here would be to use one of the different color contrast checkers that I've linked um, to check the colors in your style in your style guide. So I think we can probably um, break here for that. Let me go back to our section page. There's an activity here. So um, you might have been following along. Otherwise, you can always come back to this page. And so the section about color contrast is near the bottom. And it says here, check your color palette for contrast. It's got some guidance on what to look for if you developed a style guide using sharing and themer. It has a link to color contrast ratio guidelines. And then it also links to three different checking tools that I like to use. The first one is great for checking two colors next to each other. And then the second two are tools that are specifically made to check multiple colors against each other for contrast. It can be really handy if you have multiple colors in your palette to use one of these tools. And then I have an example of contrast checking with the web aim contrast checker below that you can look at when you want to. Okay, I think I'll stop here. All right, let's uh, we'll go into the next section and then in um, about 540, I'm um, 540 Eastern. So about, no, no, sorry, 550, we will um, we'll have a little, another 10 minute break where everyone can kind of get up and stretch a little bit. So um, hang on, let me, I'm gonna try something a little bit different for this screen share, just so that I can make sure that everybody can see all of the things. Share. So, okay. All right, Sylvia, can you, can everyone see this? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, so we're gonna talk about CSS a little bit. Um, I love this tweet uh, from Ijimaka. She said, um, I can't believe that a desire to customize shiny apps and my sharing and slide scammed me into finally getting a baseline knowledge of CSS and HTML. And that is my goal, to scam you into learning a little bit of CSS and HTML so we can make our slides pretty. So um, to, let's do this together. Um, you probably want to restart your R session just so there's nothing hiding out in there. You can push Control, Shift, and F10. 
that's a hard one for me to do on my keyboard sometimes, but it uh, takes a lot of fingers. And then you can open the folder six intro CSS and six dash start dot RMD. I'm gonna have little breaks where we can um, step out and try these things. So, okay, so you've probably seen slides that are, are slide our markdown for slides that looks a lot like this, where you have a pull, a dot pull left and a square bracket, and then a dot pull right and a square bracket, and a dot footnote. And um, maybe you've used these and never thought about them, or maybe you've uh, used them and wondered where they came from, but we're gonna find out today. So we're gonna make our own versions of these and, um, and see how they work. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is if you're in that six dash start, that RMD, you're going to run infinite moon reader, and then put dot big around some of the words on the slide. Just pick some words on the slide and put dot big around it. So I'll put a minute on the clock and we'll be, and uh, go ahead and try that. So if everything went well, did, did the words get big? Um, it's pretty cool, right? And this is one of those places where infinite moon reader is very helpful uh, because it can, you can actually see these changes happen live in inside of our studio um, if you want. Um, and if you have a question, please just use the, the chat to submit that and I'll um, answer them as we go. Okay, so your slides probably looked like this. Maybe you put the word, maybe you put this dot big around the text most endangered. Um, that's what I did. And that's kind of, so you end up with slides that maybe looked sort of like this. Uh, your most endangered words got bigger. Uh, pretty cool. Okay, so if you were inside of our studio now, we're going to click this little um, sort of, okay, so you find your slides and then in the corner, there's gonna be the upper left corner of the slides window. Inside of our studio, there's a little uh, window with an arrow and if you click that button, it opens in a browser. And if your browser is Firefox, then it will look exactly more or less like what my browser is. But also if you could open it in Chrome, that's another great place to do this. So I'm going to right click anywhere on this slide and just find this uh, option that says inspect. And when I inspect, it brings up uh, this whole, a whole lot of stuff uh, that, um, that we saw just a second ago when Sylvia showed us the accessibility testing. Um, a quick tour on the left or somewhere you'll see a bunch of uh, these kinds of things. This part is HTML and this way you can explore what shows up on your page. So you can kind of like just scroll through it and see what each element is. And we're going to try to find, um, there's also this button right here and up in the upper left corner. And when you pick it, it says pick any element from the page and you can actually hover over parts of the page and see what they are. So I'm going to do that to find where it says uh, span, where it says big, where our big is actually applied. And you can see on this part, which sometimes, depending on how big your window is, sometimes it's in the bottom, you'll find a big, I'll put it back over here. You'll find a dot big, and then it, you have this part here that says font size two. So you could try this. Uh, if you highlight the two and push up, or down, you can change this live um, and see what happens. All right, so I, I maybe I want this to be like very big and I'll go to six or seven M. We'll talk about M in a little bit. Okay, so now your turn to try this. Um, do something interesting with the big class, try something else. If you click in here, click somewhere in here, you can, um, start typing new rules. So you could try color, for example, and maybe you're gonna put, uh, you can just like look through this list here and, uh, and pick a color. If you're on the, uh, if you're on the slide with, um, with the text, you can see that as I change this, it will um, update and you can kind of walk through it and find a color that you like. So I'm gonna put, sorry, I'm gonna put this back on the screen, the instructions, I'll do another minute on the clock and um, go ahead and try setting the color or the font property. Okay, so I'm just wrapping up. I chose sea green for my color and I, uh, I found this one. So if I, I started typing font and I saw that there's a bunch of different things, I found font style and I'm gonna type, 
italic here. And um, and going back here, my here's what uh, here's what my text looks like now. Okay, so we were doing this inside of the browser, um, which means that if I reload the slides in the browser, uh, it the changes won't uh, won't persist. Well, this rule won't be saved anywhere. So we're going to actually get this out of the browser and into um, into our our markdown. Um, so what you can do is you can right click on this rule and um, in Firefox, I get a menu that gives me copy rule. In Chrome, I think you might have to like highlight the whole rule, but you can click copy rule, go back to our studio, find the extra.css file and just paste that in there. I'll give everyone a few seconds to do that. Maybe I might even overwrite the big and have my own, my new one. And uh, when you save it, it'll be reloaded. Okay, so now that you're inside of your extra.css file, try writing your own rule called uh, dot fade. So take a look at the rule that we use for big. You're gonna follow that pattern and you're gonna use that to set opacity to 0 0.66. Then when you're done with that, go back to your slides and add dot fade around the lemur image. I'll put two minutes on the clock for everyone. Okay, so hopefully you have something that looks sort of like this. You have in your extra.css file, you have a new rule for dot fade, and it uh, has the open curly braces, and then you say opacity colon 0 0.66. And if you've put that around the lemur image, you probably have something uh, you probably have a, a faded lemur image now in your slides preview. You might have to save uh, the, 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 the slides R markdown file so that, that, that Infinite Moon Reader will do the updating. And then um, you should have a faded lemur on your slides. Okay. So what you just did, what you did just did is you wrote a, a CSS rule, basically. So there's a couple different pieces to this, and we'll start at a, a pretty low level. And the idea is that it, CSS rules start with the selector. The selector says, helps the browser find a particular thing on the page. It helps go looking through the HTML to find something specific. And then property, you, uh, you set a property equal to some value. So you just change some property of the thing that you found and you set it to this new value, right? In our case, um, maybe we had for the, for the big class, we set the size, the font size to 2M, whatever an M is. And we set the color specifically to, to cornflower blue. Um, there's two other kind of, there's one other kind of concept that's sort of important. And there's a difference between, um, as far as sharing is concerned, there's a difference between um, these things when they're written on one line and these things that go around two lines. The one thing I want to kind of point out is notice that that here, this dot big with the brackets, um, looks a lot like this dot big from our CSS rule. And that's really the connection between the two of them. So this one on, that is on just a single line, this sort of wraps around just a little section of text. Whereas when you put uh, this, um, the class name, so this is called a class when you have the dot and then the words afterwards, that's called a class. When you put the class name and the brackets around a whole section, then um, it, actually it actually contains in sort of like a big box, um, all of the content that's inside. So let's look, so let's look at what this, um, source ends up looking like if we open it in the inspector. If I'm going to come here again, I'll just click on some part of the slide and click inspect. And you can see that I have um, a, you can see here's the pull right. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. Um, we have a, a, and I'll focus just on the HTML. We have a pull right and then, and this goes inside of a div. So divs go around whole sections of content. And then we have our, um, our the cutest with the class big inside of a span tag. And spans go around just like little tiny sections, like few, a few words, for example. Um, and the difference here is in, in terms of CSS and HTML language, 
the span is inline, so it's inside the line, and um, a div is a block element, so it's a whole big chunk of something that ends up being on the page. Okay. So let's try this. I have uh, a second slide in that six dat, um, start dot RMD that you can take a look at. Um, it contains a figure, so we can use the, the knitter fig chunk trick that we learned a little bit earlier. And with Infinite Moon Reader running, you can actually write your CSS inside of two style tags. This is kind of fun because when you write your CSS there instead of a separate file, you see the updates happening live. So I invite you to, to write this angle bracket style, a new line, and then angle bracket with a backslash, or is that a forward slash? forward slash style angle bracket again, and then write your CSS inside of that chunk. And, um, and I'm gonna put three minutes on the clock with these instructions, and um, I'll leave these up. These are also on our activity page. And, um, and then when the timer is up, we'll move into a break and you can get up and stretch your legs and, um, and we'll be back at the top of the hour. Coming back after break, I hope everyone got to stretch out a little bit. We're going to go ahead and get started again with our new section, which is section seven about accessibility with CSS and HTML. So this one will build on what we learned in the last section, which was the intro to CSS. We'll, we'll be using some of what we learned there. Um, to figure out how to leverage CSS and HTML to make our slides more accessible. So I'm gonna go ahead and go full screen for now. Okay. So this section has an activity and so you'll be able to find it in the uh, 07 folder and the 07 star.rmd file. Um, although I did when I was, when I was um, doing this, a couple minutes ago, I realized that there's a styling sheet missing in that folder and I apologize, um, but it's okay because what I'll do is just demo the process that you would have gone through um, anyway. So don't worry about opening up anything if you don't want to, because um, I think we will definitely need the styling to make sense of what we're gonna cover. Okay, so the first part is adding alt text with HTML. So. We talked about, um, I think it was section five, about how to add alt text with Markdown and also with our Markdown code chunks. Um, what we didn't talk about was how to do it when you just wanna insert an image using raw HTML. And we can do this by using the alt attribute um, within an image tag. So an image tag um, is what inserts an image into your document. And so generally there is, um, well, I think always, there's a source um, where you indicate which file you, um, you would like to insert. And then you can also use the alt attribute to insert alt right into that image. So a fun fact is that common black lemurs will, which are uh, featured on the right-hand side of this slide, will coax toxic millipedes to release toxins. And then they use these toxins as insect repellent by rubbing the millipedes all over their fur. Um, I thought that was a very fun fact. And what I'd like to do is open up the browser inspection, which I um, realized because my co-instructor told me didn't show last time, but I'm hoping it shows this time. Um, oh, I clicked the wrong button. I just want to show you what that looks like on the back end. So we travel back to our lemur image. I'm going to right click anywhere on the slide, click inspect. Again, I'm using Firefox. And so on my browser, the inspection shows up on the left hand side versus with Garrick, it was showing up on the right hand side, but it's the same. Um, they're the same tools. And so what I want to show here is I'm going to use that picture an element feature that Garrick demoed. Navigate over to the image so we can see it's selected. I click there and so it highlights on the left hand side and so we can see here there is an image tag. There's a source attribute that points to where that image is located 
on my computer and, um, or I, I should say in the repository that's building uh, the slides. And then there's also an alt attribute here and you can see that I've inserted some alt text. So this is what ends up getting read aloud by screen reader technology. And in this case, I also specified a width because I wanted, to, I wanted it to be a certain, uh, certain width and so you can specify that as well. Okay, so the activity asks us to replace the alt text in slide three, and so we can do that together. And so here the suggestion is to replace the text that we just took a look at, which is a common black lemur with millipede in one hand and flies hovering overhead with, a different, um, with different alt text that better matches the information being conveyed. So in the accessible design section earlier, we talked about how um, we don't necessarily want to use the same alt text for every image, even if it's identical, because it really depends on the context. And so on the, the, the alt text that's provided that starts, that talks about, the, excuse me, it talks about the millipede um, and the flies is appropriate for the slide in which it was used, which was talking about this fun fact that lemurs um, use millipede toxins as insect repellent. But in this other example, it's, it's um, not context relevant. And so I'm gonna copy this alt text from the right-hand side. And then I'll switch over to my IDE where I have the 07 star R markdown file open. Oh, hold on a second. I think I didn't share that time. Let me try. Okay, okay, there we go. So I'm in my IDE right now. There's an 07-start um, R markdown file on the left and then my console on the right. So I'm gonna run Trangan Infinite Moon Reader to preview my slides. And I, when I added the style sheet that was missing and so now we see some styling in the slides. Um, but if I navigate to the slide that has these lemurs on it. Okay, so this slide talks about how common black lemurs are sexually dichromatic. So that means that females and males exhibit differently colored fur in this case. And so we wanna replace the alt text with something that makes a little bit more sense in that context. Um, and so I'm gonna replace the alt text here on line 40, which talks about the millipede and the flies with the alt text that we pasted or copied over from the example slide, which now reads female common black lemur with brown orange fur and white ear tufts. And so that seems more appropriate to this particular slide than the last um, example of alt text. And then likewise, the male um, illustration or the illustration of a male has alt text that describes what a male common black lemur looks like. Okay, back on to the slides. What about if we want to add alt text to background images? So we talked about how to, um, or how it might be really nice to cover your whole slide with, with whether it's a data visualization or whether it's um, uh, an image that you, that you like or that helps you convey your message. If we want to add it as a background image, we know we can do that with sharing in using um, classes and properties right under the three dashes that create a new slide. But there isn't a space there for alt text. Um, it's not as easy to add. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to use some special attributes to uh, a span tag. Um, and so these special attributes are role and aria label. And these are both helpful for screen readers when they're navigating the context and reading aloud what's there. And so this is an example of what that would look like. So we would have um, a background image on the slide, and then we would insert a line of code that could read span and then specify the role as image, and then specify that the ARIA label is the alt text that we would like it to be, and then we close span, and that will um, in effect provide alt text for the background image. So in practice, 
this would um, look a little similar to the slide that we're on right now. So in this case, I have a background image that I've added to the slide and I specified the URL for that image. And then I've specified that I want the image to cover the entire slide. And then I have some text written in Markdown, a heading that I'd like to include. And then I insert that span with the role and the ARIA label. Whoops. And so what it ends up looking like is something like this. So there's a background image that covers a whole slide. And then there's the heading that I specified. And then if we wanted to double check and make sure that the alt text got through, we could inspect the slide. Okay, let's see, where is it? So it's in that div. There's our heading. And then here under P, which is paragraph, is where we'll find that span um, tag that we inserted. Okay, another, um, another way that CSS can help us improve accessibility of our documents is by helping us style links, for example, so that color isn't the only indicator. Sometimes style sheets will use color as a way to distinguish a link from other text. And it's not enough information for somebody to know that that's a link that's clickable. And the most common or the most familiar um, decoration that we might see for links around the web is text underlining. And so we can use a text decoration CSS property to style the element that corresponds to links, which is A, and A is for anchor. So what we would do is we would want to apply some underlining to our link text. So we would navigate to the slide titled st styling links and we would paste the CSS rule here on the slide into our extra CSS style sheet. So I'm going to copy that, come back to my IDE, open up my extra CSS file, which is empty, paste the rule in there. And before I save, I just want to navigate back to the viewer pane and to the specific slide that we're interested in. Okay, so in this particular example, the slide reads styling links, and then the text says, this is an example of a link, and then it says Duke Lemur Center, 100 Lemur days, 15 to 30. But just looking at this, I can't tell what part of this is a link. It all looks the same to me. And so by adding this class, or the CSS uh, rule to our CSS sheet. We're going to save it and then see how things change. Okay, so the live preview has now updated the slides and added some text decoration to the link, which is the underline. And so now I can tell what's a link and what's not on this slide. So for another example uh, that we can use, is, um, is styling text with uppercase. Sometimes we might want to use uppercase letters for emphasis or for aesthetics, and it can be tempting to insert the letters individually, you know, using the shift key on your keyboard or caps lock. But when we do this, it can sometimes cause screen readers to read each letter individually like an acronym. Not all the time, but this happens sometimes. And so instead, what we can do is use a class that I'm calling upper, and it's applying this rule, which is a text transform, um, and the transformation is uppercase. And so anything in this upper class that we're def defining is going to get transformed into uppercase. And so the, the upper class produces capitalized words, which is what's happening here, but they still read like case sensitive text to a screen reader. So the CSS again looks like text transform uppercase. And then behind the scenes, if we were to inspect this in the browser, we would see a span tag and the, we would see that the class upper that we made is applied. And then the text within that span is capitalized words, but even though they appear to us to be in all caps, on the back end, it's still case sensitive. So let's take a look at what that is like in our, our markdown file with the next activity. So I'm going to copy this rule from the slide, which is that text transform rule. 
and add that to my CSS sheet. And so when I save it, um, let's navigate to the example for uppercase. Okay, so now I'm on a slide titled transforming text to uppercase. And I haven't saved my sheet yet, so the new rule hasn't applied, but I'll do that now. Okay, so now the rule has been applied to some of the text on the in the R Markdown file, and so now it reads, hello there, I'm transforming this text to uppercase where this text is capitalized. And that appears in our R Markdown file um, this way. So there's the upper class that's applied to the words this text in square brackets. Okay, and here's another example, or another view of the same example, where in the R Markdown file, we would see upper being applied to the words this text. And then on the right hand side of the slide, we see what that would look like um, as the output. And we see that the words this text are in uppercase. Okay, and then the last chunk here is about icons. So icons like the Wikipedia W that I have, I'm using as an example in this slide, they need to be used with context in mind. So the Font Awesome package is really great because it has a couple, or it has multiple different um, arguments for the function FA, which calls on Font Awesome icons. But the one I wanna focus on here is the A11Y um, argument, which where A11Y stands for accessibility. That's a common um, abbreviation. I, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but that's commonly seen around when people are talking about web accessibility. So in this case, we set A11Y equals to um, SEM, which stands for, or is short for semantic. And that provides some extra information from, for screen readers on the back end, so that when a screen reader reads the, the icon aloud, it will read like Wikipedia W. And so the example used um, in here is, we're specifying the icon with Wikipedia dash W, and then we're saying that we would like um, the accessibility argument to be SEM or semantic. And so again, the R code is shown on the top part of the slide. And then behind the scenes, what this looks like is an SVG um, or scaled vector graphic, which is inserted as a function of, or because of the function FA in the Font Awesome package. And we can see that it's applying some of those special attributes we talked about before. So there's an ARIA label here that has information that's read aloud um, to the screen reader, which is Wikipedia W. And then it also has the image attribute, which is specifying, oh, actually this is backwards. I think this should say role equals uh, IMG or image. So I need to fix that. Um, and then there'll be more SVG properties associated with creating that icon. And then there's a title that's applied that's the same as the ARIA label, which again is Wikipedia W. But the icons aren't always um, conveying information for us. Sometimes the information around the icon is providing the same information. And so it's really not necessary to also add that information on the back end for screen readers. And so in this case, we can use the accessibility argument equals to DECO or DECO, which is short for decorative, and that's the default. And so in this case, a screen reader will, will skip over the icon altogether. And so I wanna note that a decorative icon or a decorative image for that matter is appropriate only when it's not the only element that's conveying important information. And uh, again, here's an example of what the R code, the R code that would be written where we're specifying DECO as the accessibility argument. And then SVG behind the scenes looks similar, um, except there isn't the the title of the icon or anything describing the icon because of the special attribute aria hidden, which is set to true. And so that hides the element from the screen reader. And then this last one is inserting, is another way to insert icons, which is to use raw HTML. And so if you travel to the Font Awesome website, for example, and you're looking through icons and you copy the HTML that's provided there readily, that styling or that uh, HTML code will get will cause a screen reader to skip over the icon. And so it's really only appropriate when the icon is decorative. And, um, and so if we wanted to make it accessible to screen readers, 
then we would add some of those special accessibility attributes that we talked about before, like role and ARIA label. We're finished here. And you can return to this activity whenever you like. Um, I would just recommend copying over a sharing and themer style sheet so that the slides are rendered appropriately. Okay. All right. All right. So let's do, let's move to the next activity, which is going to be learning a little bit more uh, CSS. Um, in one second, and I will copy the link into the chat. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to do, we'll talk a little bit about CSS, and then at the end, we'll have a short activity. We'll go back into our breakout rooms again. Um, so we've been kind of like walking around a little bit. Uh, we've been using CSS to do some basic styling, and we've been looking at a little bit of HTML, but uh, to get really proficient at writing these kinds of classes and working with them inside of sharing in slides, uh, we need to learn a little bit more about the structure of HTML. So I have kind of the, the start of a div element here, and there are three pieces to this. We have the, the name of the element, so this is a div. It has a class, which is special. And in CSS, if I want to focus on the fact that it has the class special, I'm going to write dot special. For the div, I can just write the name of the, or for the element, I can just write the name of the element. But for the class, you can, you have to say, okay, so this, this element has class special, so I'm going to put a dot in front of it. And then this element also has an ID attribute, right? And it's called, uh, it has the ID slide fact. So to reference this element by ID, I'm going to put a pound in front of that, or a number sign, or hash, or the, I don't remember the actual name for this icon, but we all call it the hashtag or something. Right, so you do hash slide facts. Okay, so these are three different ways that you can identify the same element with CSS. And I've ordered them on this slide from their least specific to most specific. So you can have lots of div elements, you can have lots of paragraph elements, you can have lots of other kinds of elements, right? And they're all sort of the same. Some of them might have uh, some of them might have classes, and those classes make them a little bit more special, and identifying them by class is a little bit more specific. But an ID is unique. So an element or in HTML, your IDs should be unique. I mean, it won't break if they're not, but they should be. And so an element that's identified by an ID is like that specific element. A class might be a certain type of element. And then um, the just by referencing it by name is like the least specific way that you could uh, reference an element. So let's think about how we can put these things together. So here's something that might come out of a sharing slide. We have a div, it has a, a class of pull right, and it has a class of fact. So what are some of the ways that we could identify this element? Here are three possibilities. We could call it div and CSS, right? So how do we select this element in CSS? We could call it div, we could call it dot pull right, or we could call it dot fact. Okay, what if we want to find the div that has a pull right class and a fact class? We can just put all of these identifiers together. And because the div part of this was less specific than the class part, we're really totally covered if we just drop the div and say, look, we're looking for a pull right dot fact dot pull right dot fact. So if we're writing a CSS rule that's going to change the style of a pull right or an element with pull right in fact as classes, we're going to we're going to reference it as dot pull right and dot fact. Okay, and in uh, like the difference between the CSS selector and what we actually write in Markdown is so small um, with sharing in. So you just would have put little brackets around your content, and um, and that's how you would get an element like the one above. Okay, what if we have just a regular old p tag? inside of here. So like we have a fact and uh, and it's pulled to the right and it says uh, lives in trees. And that's going to be inside of like a regular paragraph tag. Uh, there's nothing special about paragraph except for the fact that it's inside of an of a div with class pull right and class fact. So we can, the only way we could identify this element is saying it's P, at least finding this specific element, but we can use the, the fact that it's within the fact class div 
to locate it. In this case, there is a little tiny space right here. And, um, and that's how we go, okay, we're looking for uh, fact here. And then within fact, somewhere inside, we're gonna have our paragraph tag. Okay. So let's see how this actually plays out in, um, in some slides. To make this easy, I like put this all in my um, in this slide. So I have a CS, CSS rules over here that I'm gonna fill in and I have some markdown for the slides. You can see I have a, a dot fact inline. I also have, here's our dot fact dot pull rate and a little note and then another fact. And another little bit is that our slide itself has the class special, okay? so. If I show you the whole HTML, this is a lot to parse. So let's look at the slide, but I've added little bits of HTML that are kind of the most relevant pieces. So the whole slide is going to be inside of a div with the class special up here. And then we have um, an H1 tag which for the heading, the first heading or level one heading that says interesting lemur facts. We have a paragraph and inside of that there's a fact and then our pull right fact and our another paragraph. Okay, so let's try to change the color of the fact and we'll see what happens. So if I say color for fact is uh, dark orange, um, we can see that anything that's wrapped inside a fact becomes dark orange. The whole paragraph here becomes dark orange and just the little text here that um, uh, around uh, diurnal or arboreal become orange. I can also change the color of everything on the slide by doing something like uh, deep pink. And now everything on the slide, including the slide, like all everything that's inside of the slide with class special. So this class special finds this slide and now everything is pink. You'll notice though that the heading, the H1 tag is not, right? So maybe there's a more specific rule that's overwriting that, but I could still say H1 and write a new CSS rule and say color and now I have to think of a third color, um, maroon, right? There we go. So these colors are not the best, obviously, but you can kind of start to see where what is what is being applied. If I actually go to the slide, look, just looking at the slide, this looks great, except for the fact that I've also changed the heading for like all of the other slides. So I've changed the H1 color for every slide in my deck, um, and that's kind of what this referencing an element just by name will do, is it's very generic and will just um, target anything that's an H1. So what if I want to just change this, the H1 on my special slide? So I'll call that special. I'll write a rule that has that special followed by a space and then the H1 element. And this says any H1s that are inside of a dot special or inside of a div with class special will, will, be, will work, right? So now my slide, um, my special slide is, is very special and my other slides are normal. Okay. So I want to show you another really cool feature of, so this is kind of like how you put put together the little pieces so you can find stuff on your slides. Um, and I happen to know all of these as like HTML colors, um, but I'm gonna show you a kind of interesting way that uh, Sharing and Themer can work with you to make coloring these things and, um, and doing stuff a little bit more interesting. So uh, there's, a, there's a feature of CSS called CSS variables, which means uh, it's ways that you can store information in variables kind of like you can in R. It works very similarly. So, um, it would work something like this. What if I defined a variable called hot pink and I gave it this, um, this color, which you just have to take my word for it is hot pink. Then I can use that variable by, instead of referencing, like normally you'd have to write out this part in your CSS, you'd have to write out the hash FF41B4, but instead you can use var, then the double, the double slash is the kind of the indicator of a variable. And you can just drop this in right here. And now um, anywhere that you referenced hot pink is uh, gonna work. So what if I jump back to my slides and I say var uh, hot pink. Mm, no, I need something else. Like what about forest green? Just so we like have different colors here, forest green um, and hot pink. Uh, I put a, there it is. There, hot pink. Okay, 
So this is awesome. But the other really cool thing is that and you can also overwrite these things. So um, I could say that on my special slide, the hot pink color is actually going to be sky blue. And, um, and so just for my special, you can rewrite the variable and do this. Um, it's also a nice way to kind of make your, your, your things sort of, um, your slides uh, easy to change. And part of the reason that I'm showing you all of this is because this is something that uh, Sharingan Themer will do for you. So each of the, um, so if you look at like one of the style functions, each of the style functions, you, you give it colors, you give it a bunch of different parameters and Sharingan Themer will store those in, um, in CSS variables. And the way that you find out which ones they are and how to use them is by going to the documentation and you say, okay, so I gave you a primary color. How can I reference that in CSS? And um, for example, the primary, if you're using a duo theme will be uh, available as a CSS variable called primary. And there's a whole bunch of other ones there. So um, one of the other ways that this can be really helpful is to use the colors argument of any of the style functions. So a really common thing would be to write out um, a set of colors. And I like doing this in R. It's important that you have uh, names that are going to make sense to CSS. So you can't use um, you know, spaces and you can't use dots in your um, color names. But if you give it sensible names, um, like this, this color will be called orange and this color will be called pink. And um, if I pass it to the colors argument of style duo or sty any style function, um, Sharingan Themer will add CSS variables for this. It also gives you classes for each of those colors. So I had an orange color and it will give you a class that you can use in, in your R markdown called dot orange. It also give you one called dot BG dash orange and that will let you change the background. So it'll change either the foreground or the background color. So this is a really nice way of, of establishing a palette in R that you can use inside of your, inside of your CSS. You can use it inside of your, um, your R markdown source. And, um, and now that it's also in R, you could also hand this off to um, a, plot, a plotting function like ggplot. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's jump over to this, um, the, uh, the um, activity which I will share in the slide in the chat again. And um, we're going to explore practicing using CSS variables and selectors, um, probably about five minutes in our groups. And, um, and I'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Okay, everybody have fun with this one. Okay, welcome back. I hope that went all right. And you got a little bit of practice, but there might even be a little bit more that you can do uh, later afterwards. So the last thing I want to talk about is how we can bring all of these ideas together in a concept called design components. So I invite you to think about your favorite song. Like, What is it about your song that your favorite song that makes it something that you would recognize instantly? Like how long would it take you to, 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 to identify it? And like, what parts of the song are the things that, um, that you remember or think of. Um, would you recognize your song if you were walking by someone who was playing it in the street? Um, is it something that you would recognize if you just heard a few notes played by someone on a piano? Um, we can do something similar with our slides in terms of making it easy to identify what is going on in them and what we want people to do. Um, it's a lot easier to follow so follow somebody when they're consistent and the structure of your slides and where you put the things on your slides guides people's attention as they listen to you. Um, where should you look? Where should you be looking when you're looking at slides with lots of text and lots of different things going on? Then so design makes communication easier. Uh, if you were following what I would was showing on the screen and listening to me, it was probably harder to hear and harder to understand exactly what was going on because everything was moving around. And so the consistency that we get from design helps us to communicate better because it, it makes our, 
uh, it makes it easier to understand what we're what we're trying to communicate. It makes it easier for us to follow, and we're giving the audience visual clues about things that they should be doing, or should be understanding, or should be seeing at certain points in time. Um, so, let's think about the different ways that you can apply design thinking to Sharingan slides. And the first place is at the textual level. So we saw these inline classes that you could put around small words, and um, and in this way, you would you want to try to think about making these consistent, using certain colors to signal certain things, using bold to signify certain things, um, uh, and 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 that way you can think about specific words or specific phrases that you want to apply a little bit of design to to signal your intention with them. Maybe you want blocks of things. You want to have a certain column or a certain type of container to signify something. Um, like a yellow box or a red box to be a side note or a sidebar or an, an important thing that you want people to take away from your presentation. And so that would be at the block level. And finally, you could have special types of slides themselves. Uh, one of the ways that we've done this throughout our presentations is to change the, the background color of all of the headings when we thought maybe you, there was an activity that you would be doing. Uh, those have all been blue with white text and then our regular slides are usually a blue text on a white background. Um, and these are the three levels of, of thinking that you want to bring to, to your slides as you're designing them um, to communicate effectively. So I have one little tiny trick that I really want to show you, and so I'm just going to squeeze it in right now. It's uh, this little thing. Uh, so you can find lots of really great images from a service online called Unsplash. Uh, they are freely usable images. It, it's very helpful if you um, if you give credit to the people who took the pictures, but they're free to use in your presentations and they look beautiful. They were the first three images that I used in this slide deck were from there and uh, we've, we've used lots of images from Unsplash. So you just go to unsplash.com. You can search for something like lemurs. You get back a, a bunch of um, pictures like these. And maybe you like this first picture here in the middle of a group of lemurs and say, okay, I'm going to use that. Um, the, if you like actually click on that image, you'll see that there's a link, um, you know, you'll go to the, like the web page and there's an ID for that. And it's, you know, the, the web link is something like unsplash.com slash photos. But anyway, if you just take that ID and you change the, uh, the URL and go to source.unsplash.com, um, you can just get that image directly from unsplash. And so you can make very cool slides with uh, with very beautiful backgrounds, um, kind of like this one. Um, and here I've used uh, the background image and I've given a URL and here linking to source.unsplash.com with the ID. If you happen to know the, the um, ratio of your slides, in my case, I'm using widescreen, so they're like 16 by 900. You can actually put that after the ID and you can end up uh, with a perfectly framed um, image. So uh, that's a pretty cool little trick that I really just wanted to share with you. So for the final activity, we're going to kind of put everything together in, in one of two ways. So your job is to pick which one you would like to do for the next activity. And you can um, either take an interesting quote on a boring slide and turn it into a fancy quote slide, or you can take a regular slide with a little bit of text and turn it into a sidebar image um, or yeah, sidebar slide template. So from the activity page, you can choose either quote slide. So you can take a slide that looks like this and turn it into a slide that looks like this. Or you can choose slide templates and take a slide that looks like this and turn it into a slide that looks like this. So I'm going to send everybody back into the breakout groups for 10 minutes and I'll see you at the end. Okay, I think everyone's back from breakout rooms. Um, I just wanted to take an opportunity to thank use our organizers uh, for a great conference and letting us have this time to teach a Sharingan workshop. And I'd also love to thank our teaching assistants for today, both Shannon and Patricia. They were really wonderful in providing support. Um, thanks also to the technical support that we had today with David, who's wonderful. Um, also, the Duke Lemur Center, Rachel Hudson, the illustrator, and uh, a special thank you to Liz here, who's a colleague and friend, and has provided a lot of, um, of insight and experience into what it's like to navigate sharing in slides uh, with the screen reader.
Oh, and thank, thank all of you also. I forgot about that. I uh, very intentionally wanted to thank all of you for showing up, for waking up early, staying up late, and spending this time with us. Yes, yeah, so we'd like to say thank you again. Uh, we had a great time with you, and we hope you've learned something. And, um, and I just want to make a note that all of the materials are available online um, at the website. They'll stay up there for a long time, and you can always go back and check out uh, those materials and come back to them.